Joshua, as a physician and a uh, biological scientist, uh, and as someone who thinks philosophically, how do you, can you apply the, the way of thinking of philosophy of biology uh, to medicine and healthcare? That's a great question. So medicine and healthcare really is going to immediately start involving humans in a much more central way than biology has to. Of course, biology does study humans, but there's a whole new set of the questions that come, and come up and that become a central concern when you start dealing with humans. We're wondering about how to make individuals healthy, how to make communities healthy, how to make societies healthy, and, and how to take the knowledge we have in biology and actually apply that in medicine. Now, historically, uh, you know, medicine and healthcare really developed in many ways in the modern sense as we understand them now after biology too. So it ends up becoming, um, you know, you can even go back to, you know, Darwin and Huxley. Darwin first proposes uh, evolution amongst animals in the plant kingdom, and famously, the origin of the species doesn't touch on human evolution at all. It's really Huxley who kind of rushes in where Darwin feared to threat, <laughs> tread and talks about uh, human evolution and man's, man's place in nature. And then that whole debate goes on and it becomes far more complicated and messy and controversial. That, in a way, is a pretty good description of what happens with biology <laughs> when you start moving to medicine and healthcare. That there's definitely things that are important and continuous with it. But when we start dealing with the, the human animal, the human condition, and all the concerns of health and medicine, then it just gets more complicated and interdisciplinary far more than you really well, what, what are some of the categories that you worry about? Obviously, you worry about uh, ethical uh, approaches in terms of experimentation. I mean, that's obvious. Um, another is uh, allocation of resources to different facets uh, of individuals, groups, um, different diseases. Do they, you know, some, some diseases have uh, better lobbying groups in Washington to allocate funds for. Uh, how, how do you uh, do deal with those kinds of issues? Yeah, so this, this ends up being something that the translation between basic biology research to clinical healthcare is really hard. And I think the reason why um, it really has to do with, the, with, really you can trace almost all the difficulty back to the challenges of the ethics involved in, in, in dealing with humans. Uh, you can understand something with a certain level of uncertainty in science and that's okay. You need to have a lot higher certainty when it comes to dealing with humans. Uh, there's a certain way things can go wrong in science when you're dealing with you know, non-human biological organisms. Um, and even the ethical tragedies there are not so bad compared to the level of tragedy that can happen when you're dealing with, with humans. And so, understandably, there's a lot more regulation and complexity. Here, here's a great example. I mean, you know, my group, we're actually spending a lot of time, and in the field, people are spending a lot of time trying to get computers how to learn images and how to perceive and recognize things in images well. And it's, it's kind of amazing how good these algorithms have yeah. gotten in deep learning to be able to recognize interesting things. Yeah, you've been a, a, a pioneer in using AI in, in, in healthcare and in medicine and analysis. Yeah, I was, I was lucky to get involved in the field. The, the, I say that I was doing you know, deep learning before it was called deep learning. <laughs> um, and you know, trained under some of the, some of the early people uh, in the field too. But um, you know, there's, a, there's a certain sort of, uh, of certainty you need to have and how well it's working when you're just trying to classify images on the internet to improve search results. Uh, not to disparage that at all. I mean, we really want to have things that are really helpful that, that uh, help us identify information in that informal setting often and maybe even more focused ones. But it's a very different thing when we're trying to apply those algorithms to understand the pathology image or radiology image and then put that into practice in a way that will change care and determine who gets a surgery or who, who doesn't yeah. or who gets a kidney and who doesn't. Uh, it's, it's, it's just a far higher stakes question where, uh, where we really need to, uh, need to start thinking very differently. And it's all because of ethical reasons that that's the case. Yeah. Also, reproducible, re reproducibility of results, um, because there have been uh, many studies recently, particularly in the psychological sciences, but also in the medical sciences, uh, of the lack of reproducibility of very significant data. Uh, I think the psychological sciences are probably the, <laughs> the largest offender, but uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, you know, comes comes close as, as number two. Yeah, so the there's a lot of human factors <laughs> in medicine, which is kind of a euphemism to say the stuff that we don't really have a good handle on. And I think in medicine, it's really well recognized 
that there's a lot of human factors and those human factors are important. So you can't entirely neglect them. Uh, that's the art side of medicine because it's very hard to systematize them at the same time. But then also we want to have like the strongest evidential basis for, for, for thinking through things. And, and the negotiation between those two things is, is not trivial. Um, there's, you can certainly do it in, in ways that are, are good and create new opportunities that do a lot of good for patients and for us as flourishing humans and things uh, that can really do a lot of damage as well. So if you look at the future, and, and the future is coming very rapidly with the use of AI in medicine, and reading images that you work on is, 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 is a core area. Uh, I, I thought I read recently that uh, uh, the uh, AI approach to reading images is up to 90% or something of the, of the of, 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 uh, uh, best practices healthcare uh, in terms of doing it that way. It, you know, how accurate would you say it is today where will it be going, and at what point would you trust AI over a, a physician who will, who will read um, imaging data to give you a result? So that, that's a common question that comes up: of like, you know, what point where AI t overtake, um, you know, the physician? You'll trust the AI more. I, I think the reality is, in almost every case, I would trust uh, a physician, a human physician, collaborating with an AI more than either one alone. Yeah, sure, that makes sense. And the reason why is even like numbers like saying it's 95% as effective as you know a human, that's normally what we've done in these cases. We've simplified the problem and we've taken out the zebras. <laughs> and what it's saying is that we're getting it 95% right when you only consider the horses. <laughs> <laughs> and what uh, humans are really good at in these contexts is understanding not just the horses, but also the zebras. And you know, zebras are those rare, things. They're not unicorns. Unicorns right. don't really exist. Right. <laughs> zebras really exist. You don't normally encounter a horse. Uh, you, you normally encounter horses. You don't normally encounter a zebra, but you do encounter them sometimes, and you don't want to treat uh, a zebra like it's a horse. And, yeah. um, you, and I think what makes really good physicians is not, uh, is not what they do with 95% of patients. 95% of patients um, are treated the same by everyone. <laughs> What really makes the really great physicians are the one who recognize that when you walk into the room that you're actually one of the zebras and need to be treated in a very, very different way. Mm. And that's the type of thing where um, AI uh, tends to struggle with. Um, there's, on a technical level, this problem of, called drop nodes, but on a bigger level, you know, in every single training set that, that we work with, we, we we're giving it a, a herd of horses and there's, there's zebras out there in the real world that kind of extend beyond the training set in ways. Can't that you train for that? Can't you deliberately feed data sets that have lots of zebras in them and, and train the AI how to recognize them? So you can when you expect it, but what do you do with the unexpected? Oh. <laughs> so the thing about the real world is that it's bewildering. It just surprises you in, into things. And yeah. that's the reason why also uh, you know, physicians have so much deep training. So when they encounter those things that are the N of one patient, it's the one patient they've ever encountered that's like this. Mm. And this, it's the only one they'll ever encounter like this. They can still reason about that patient in a sensible sort of way. Um, and you, know, you, you just can't anticipate what those zebras are going to do and what's gonna happen. And, and it can even be on things of just like, you, know, you think it's, uh, you know, a great example is like we, we, we wrote a, a piece of software to, uh, to look at kidneys. But what if uh, by mistake or whatever, it's not a kidney that's put in, but it's a liver that's put in. What does the algorithm do there? Now, uh, it's a very fair assumption to think it's only going to be kidneys that it sees. <laughs> but what if someone wrongly puts in that, in that failure mode, what happens? Now, uh, a human pathologist will immediately recognize yeah, right. it and be able to reason correctly about it. Oh, it's a mislabeled case yeah. or what have you and think about it, and there can be some fairly complicated reasoning and out-of-band communication yeah, that's necessary. Yeah. Um, and to get an AI to handle that correctly is not, um, is probably not even worth the trouble <laughs> of getting it to work versus just having an actual human in the loop um, for quite some time to come. So I think, uh, I think, you know, especially if you care not just about the horses, but also the zebras, I think we're gonna wanna have humans in the loop uh, uh, for some time to come.